Hi there! In today's class we will talk about grammar. More specifically, we will focus on morphosyntactic analysis. It is important to note that we could have adopted some other approach to the study of grammar. So, to study morphosyntactic analysis is one specific decision, one pedagogical decision for one specific course. More concretely, it is a course on the form morpho and the syntax also the form of both words and sentences. As we will later see, we need to problematize, we need to look into, delve into both categories, word and sentence. We will study the form of words and the form of sentences, but we need to problematize these two categories, we need to come to terms with what is a word and what is a sentence, and this is what we are going to do in today's class. It is important to note that there are a lot of grammars. For instance, in ancient Greece, grammar was based on rhetoric, and rhetoric was the art of speaking convincingly. Nowadays, we can study functional grammar with its metafunctions, interpersonal, experiential, textual. We will not talk about functional grammar here today in this class. I would like you to know that there is a whole class on systemic functional grammar or linguistics in our playlist, basically the one on uh, discourse analysis. Our second class is an introduction to uh, functional grammar. So if you're interested in functional grammar, you should go there. There are basically two grammars, traditional grammar and generative grammar, that deal with what we call morphosyntactic analysis. A traditional grammar is a grammar that will devote a lot of time and attention to description. There will be labeling of categories and functions of the clause, the sentence, the phrase, and the word. This is our first class in a course on morphosyntactic analysis, that is, we will devote a whole course to analyzing sentences from this perspective. There is a whole other approach known as generative grammar, which also deals with morphosyntactic analysis. For that approach, there will be a whole other course in the future. The difference between traditional grammar or morphosyntactic analysis from a traditional perspective and generative grammar is that the former deals with description of categories and functions, as we have mentioned already, and the latter is concerned with principles and parameters that pertain all languages. That is why we say that generative grammar deals with UG or universal grammar. Therefore, traditional grammar is descriptive and generative grammar is both descriptive and explanatory. That is, its aim is to account for why sentences are grammatical and also to account for the ungrammaticality of sentences. More about this in uh, our course on generative grammar, we will now plunge into traditional grammar, which is the aim and objective of this course. So, a traditional grammar approach will focus on the relationships that there exist between the constituents of a sentence or a clause. We are using the term sentence and clause as synonymous terms, we will soon see that they are quite different. Apart from dealing with the internal relations of the constituents of sentence clause, what we will do is see the kind of connections that there can be between clauses and sentences. That is, how they are conjoined, how clauses are conjoined into bigger structures that we will call sentences. We are saying something important about the difference between clause and sentence. A clause plus a clause, plus a clause. So when we start accumulating or connecting clauses, we will end up having a sentence. Therefore, we will study the interclausal relations between uh, different clauses that make up sentences. 
clause, clause, clause sentence. When we have just defined our objects of inquiry, namely the clause and the internal relationships between the elements or constituents in the clause and the connections between clauses. Now we will uh, plunge into the analysis of clauses, we will see what happens internally in clauses and we will discuss uh, some terms that are of very common use such as word and sentence and we will problematize them. We will see that it's not so easy to determine what a word is and that very often sentences are confused with clauses, for instance. So we will try to clarify those terms. The reason why a term such as word is not so clear is that in general categories can be fuzzy. What's more, we have written an article in our magazine Language Issues where we discuss the non-categorical nature of some categories. Basically the article is called Categories are not so categorical all the time and we kindly invite you to read the article if you're interested in knowing about categories and how we can problematize them. There is a link below to Flipsnack, that's where we produce our digital magazines. However, we depend on categories, so we will be making reference to a lot of categories. There is the fact that some categories are not so clear, does not entail that we can do away with them. We need categories. The first category that we will analyze is the category sentence. And I will give you an example of a sentence. I left. That would be a sentence. In traditional grammar, that is considered to be a simple sentence. Why is that a simple sentence? Because it consists of only one clause. So a simple sentence is coterminous with the clause. That is, a simple sentence equals the clause. And as we will see, sentences are made up of subjects and predicates. What about the sentence, she arrived and I left? In this case, we have a sentence that consists of two clauses. She arrived and I left. The two clauses, she arrived and I left, are coordinated, are conjoined by the conjunction AND. Now, here we got a sentence that has two clauses. Therefore, we can and we should, I think, draw a distinction between a sentence and a clause. A sentence consists of several clauses. In saying so, what we're saying is that there is a relationship of inclusion between clauses and sentences. Again, a sentence consists of several clauses. As we will see, that is not the only criterion that we will adopt in our classification of clauses. What is more, we need to decide which the fundamental criterion for a definition of a clause is. And the answer to that question is the following. In order to decide what a clause is, we need to count verbs. If we have a stretch of speech that consists of several clauses, we will know how many clauses there are by counting the number of verbs that there appear in the passage in question. The reason why that is the case is that the verb, in the future we will say predicator, but for the time being we will use the term verb. The verb is the core, pivotal, fundamental element in the clause. No verb, no predicator, no predicate, no clause. Let us bear in mind that the clauses are said to consist of subjects and predicates. However, in some languages there are passive subjects. In Spanish we can say shueve, rain. In English we need to say it is raining. English has obligatory subject, Spanish has passive subject. And in fact, all languages in the world are categorized in terms of languages that contain an obligatory subject and languages that drop the subject, that have passive subjects. However, there are no languages that can do away with predicates when defining clauses. Therefore, we can say, here there is a clause and there is no verb. That's impossible. 
If there is a clause, there is a verb. There is the defining characteristic of the, the clause, basically, because the clause consists of an optional subject and an obligatory predicate. And the predicate will contain the verb. Verbs such as break, run, jog, be. There are different kinds of verbs. We will get into that in the future. But what is important to know is that it is the verb that defines the clause. Therefore, we will say the following. We have clauses that can be identified by the presence of a verb and we can conjoin these clauses. We can put them together and form sentences that is bigger structures. We can go in that direction from the clause to the sentence or we can get into smaller units phrases, words, more things. This is what we will discuss in a minute. In order to illustrate phrases and words, we will resort to a whole other example. We will take the sentence, I put the book on the table. And we're going to say that I and put are words and the book and on the table are phrases. It's just one word, I, it's just one word, put. However, the table, on the table, the book are phrases that consist of more than one word. The book, two words, one phrase. On the table, three words, one phrase. Again, there is a relationship of inclusion that defines the relationship that there exists between phrases and words. That is, phrases consist of words. This is our starting point, and as we will see in the future, this is an oversimplification because the relationship between words and phrases is much more complex and there are other criteria that we need to take into account. Now, let us take the sentence, I bought a microwave oven. The word microwave, it's a word, but it consists of two parts, microwave. Well, let's take the word freezer. If we take the word microwave or the word freezer, we will see that these words are made up of smaller units. This is what we call a morpheme. A morpheme has traditionally been defined as the smallest unit of meaning. If we go for freezer, we will see that freeze is the verb, the root morpheme, the free morpheme, and the uh, affix or suffix er in freezer will be the bound morpheme. We will discuss morphemes and morphology in our next class. For the time being, it is important to review what we have said, basically the units of syntactic analysis. We go from the sentence, a sentence consists of one or more clauses, where the clause is defined in terms of the presence of a verb. So we have a verb, we have a clause. Now our sentences, for instance, I put the book on the table, may consist of several phrases, such as the book or on the table. Our sentences can also consist of phrases and words, I and put. And our words, such as freezer or microwave oven, will consist of morphemes that are free or bound, and these are the smallest units of meaning. So there is some sort of scale where we can go in either direction, morpheme, word, phrase, clause, sentence, or we can go the other way, sentence, clause, phrase, word, morphine. In our next class we will talk about morphology, that is we will talk about the forms and constitution of words. We will discuss free and bound morphemes and we will see the different types of combinations that we can have in the formation of words. Bye bye, see ya!